We're going to use geometric similarity to create a mathematical model to determine the terminal velocity of a raindrop. Raindrop is not necessarily important. It could be pretty much any object, depending on uh, the shape of that object, might change things a little bit. But anyway, let's just do a raindrop. So what's happening is we've got an object falling through the sky, and it's a raindrop. So we'll draw kind of this standard shape. As it's falling through the sky, um, it'll speed up and keep speeding up. The velocity gets greater and greater, but there comes a point where that velocity stops increasing and you get what's called the terminal velocity. And the reason for that is you've got these forces of gravity pulling it down, but you also have these forces of drag, air resistance, that are trying to hold it up. So the uh, drag forces are acting opposite of the forces due to gravity. And so it'll, at some point, it will slow the, the, the velocity will stop increasing and it'll just reach a terminal velocity. It, it can't speed up indefinitely, uh, otherwise it would get, uh, if there was no drag, then yes, uh, assuming no other forces are acting on it, it would speed up until it hit the ground. And maybe that happens if it's dropped close enough to the surface of the Earth. But anyway, what, what we can say about that then is that the forces due to gravity are acting positively, assuming that positively means pulling it down, and these are acting in the opposite direction, the drag forces. And so we'll simply create models or find formulas for each of these. The forces due to gravity are the easy ones because that's um, second law of mass times acceleration. And usually use a little a for acceleration. So what I get is that the force due to gravity is proportional to mass because acceleration due to gravity, that's g, which is a constant. We'll call that formula 1. And then we want to look at the uh, drag forces. Well, there, there's two different ones, or there's actually different, um, maybe not just two, but there's different uh, ways to represent that. You could say your drag forces are proportional to S, where S is going to be the cross-sectional area perpendicular to the uh, direction of the motion. So on a raindrop, that would be the cross-sections here look like they're maybe circles. Um, and so that's that's the S. It's some cross section in the direction that it's falling. Times just the velocity, or you could do it S velocity squared. This is usually reserved for smaller particles, things not moving very quickly. Um, but things that are moving quickly or are larger, the velocity has, plays a bigger role. So you square it, and so it will slow it down more quickly. And we'll say that's the case here because this thing is going to keep speeding up, speeding up. And so it, we want this to act on it, the velocity to act on it a little more than simply to the first power here. So when we read that, we got this. And we'll call that formula 2. Okay, so here's how we use the geometric similarity. We're going to assume that all falling raindrops are geometrically similar. That is, they're not just randomly shaped that there is sort of a set shape, and it turns out this is not the shape. Uh, if you believe the internet sites, the shape is typically re referred to as kind of a hamburger bun shape, which means you've got this flat part because the air resistance is actually pushing up against this raindrop, and then it's just kind of sur uh, sort of spherical on the top, or maybe not spherical, maybe it's elongated, but they fall like this. So they all look something like this, and we'll assume that we've got some characteristic dimension L. I don't even care what that dimension is. It could be the diameter, it could be the height, whatever. We're going to assume they all are geometrically similar. They're all this shape, but of different sizes, and that I've got some measurement. I'm not going to actually use this measurement anywhere in my model, but it gives me a way to reduce my variables in my model or to connect my variables in the model. So to do that, what I want to do is let's start with just this this area we know would be proportional to L squared. And we don't have volume in here yet, but we also know that volume is proportional to L cubed. Therefore, I can connect these two. If I solve for L here, I get square root, or S to the 1 half is proportional to L. V so s to the one half is proportional to l, and v to the one third is proportional to l. Therefore, s to the one half is proportional to v to the one third. And I can just say that means that cross-sectional area is actually proportional to v to the two thirds. So I've traded out 
area for volume, but the reason for that is because I can get volume related to mass. So let's see how that works. So we, we, we've got the term weight and we have the term mass. And sometimes we try we might tend to use those similarly, and they are similar, um, they're, but they're not the same thing. Mass kind of refers to the amount of matter in an object, but even though defining what matter is might be difficult, whereas weight refers to the force that's experienced by an object due to gravity. So they're not exactly the same thing, but the weight, which we'll just call W, is proportional to the mass. And weight, you may or not know, may or may not know, is equal to the density of an object, which we usually use rho, the Greek letter rho for density. So the density of an object times its volume. And density is sort of its makeup as well, kind of like matter. But um, And a raindrop has fixed density all the way through. There's not thicker on one end or anything like that. So it's, it's water. So the density is constant times volume, which means that the weight of an object is proportional to its volume. So if the weight is proportional to mass and proportional to volume, then I can say that volume is proportional to mass. But over here, I said that this cross-sectional area is proportional to the volume to the two-thirds. So I can replace the volume by mass there. And I get that this cross-sectional area is proportional to mass to the two-thirds. Okay, we'll call that four. I'm not going to necessarily use these, but they're important formulas to be able to refer back to. Um, so let's see. Now, let's talk about the terminal velocity. Well, when we reach terminal velocity, when these two forces kind of equal each other, they, they equal out, and so they subtract out, and your total force is zero. So you're no longer, you've reached this point where your velocity, um, terminal, you've reached the terminal velocity at that point when that overall force is zero. So in that case, let me scroll down a little bit. In that case, I get the forces due to gravity are the same as the force drag forces. And so what that gives me is here's my forces due to gravity. Those are proportional to M. My drag forces here, we'll go ahead and start there, is proportional to this cross-sectional area. And this is, at that point, is when we have terminal velocity, when I've got my forces are, are in equilibrium. So I get this, but we've already seen that I can replace the S by that, so I get that mass is proportional to mass to the two-thirds times this terminal velocity squared. Divide out the M, and I get that the terminal velocity squared is proportional to M to the one-third. And then get the V by itself here. The terminal velocity is proportional to m to the one sixth, and that that's a model. Terminal velocity would equal some constant times the mass of that object, that raindrop, to the one sixth. So <clears throat> this isn't the velocity when it hits the ground necessarily. This is at some point as it's falling through the sky, it will no longer speed up. Its velocity will become constant, and what we're claiming is when it will reach that constant velocity is based on the mass. Now there's a constant here that would have to be determined from some data, but in general we'd say based on the mass of that raindrop, take the sixth root of it, that will help you predict when it's going to reach its terminal velocity or what its terminal velocity would be 